I've seen members of Congress stand up at conference meetings telling leadership that instead of wasting our time on a debate over legislative proposals, we should be out fundraising. Right now, members of Congress and candidates for Congress spend anywhere between 30 and 70% of their time raising money. To receive a particular committee spot, you have to raise a certain amount of money for the party. First of all, it's totally unethical. It seems like it should be illegal. You know, they say they're trying to shrink government, but what they're really doing is just outsourcing it to contractors who then turn around and give political contributions. We have uh, over a trillion dollars in tax breaks per year in the tax code. There's no oversight on them. Do you know that we spend $50 billion a year on programs that don't even exist by law anymore? Most successful political movements in the course of our country's history have begun in the states. You know, it always seems weird to me when people refer to me as an activist. This is this incredible burgeoning movement on the rise. This is what we stand for. These are the policies that we seek to achieve. I think we have to recognize there's enormous potential to rally people from all political perspectives to the cause of reform. Because people on the left and the right both agree this system is deeply corrupted. Welcome back to the program. We're continuing now, jumping back into it. Uh, we've been talking about this on and off here for the last couple weeks. The uh, brand new documentary film entitled We Are Unrepresented. You can find him out on Facebook. Joining me right now to discuss it is Daniel Falconer. Daniel is a documentary, uh, he's a documentary filmmaker. And uh, his documentaries have focused on the hazards of corruption and failed policy and the conditions that sustain both. Uh, his writing explores humanism, interpersonal relationships, and themes of self-discovery. And he, of course, is uh, some of the moving power behind this latest film, We Are Unrepresented. And uh, I, we're going to talk with him right now. Good morning, sir. How are you? Good morning. I'm doing well. Thank you. Well, th and I uh, appreciate the program. I think this is my first time being broadcast in Alaska, at least with my consent, so I'm very excited. <laughs> at least with your consent. We won't talk about those other films, Daniel. It's fine. Yeah, thank you. Thank uh, you. you know. Um, all right, well, let's talk a little bit here about uh, We Are Unrepresented. Unrep uh, I mean, this this uncovers, um, you know, some of the corruption and the money-grubbing, how these politicians get disconnected from their constituency by the machine that is Washington, D.C., regardless of... Regardless of party or anything else, it becomes all about the power and the money instead of about representing your constituency. And uh, and and this has got a this is this is I'm excited about this. So tell me a little bit about the film. Yeah, I appreciate it. I'm glad you are excited. I can tell from what I've heard of the program that your listener base will be well acquainted with a lot of these problems. But where I hope that it's useful to them, first of all, there might be a bit of new information. Right. But additionally, it'll be a, a one hour a one hour vehicle they can use to share with friends to help bring them to the cause of reform. You know, to, it's very easy to get caught up in the individual issues that matter to us a lot, which both parties are good at dangling in front of us with kind of a false choice as we must vote for one or the other, because if not the one, the one we really don't want is going to ruin our lives in this way or that way. Right. But meanwhile, meaningful work on why am I presented with that false choice? Why does gerrymandering exist at all, et cetera, et cetera, can never get done. Conveniently, regardless of who's in power, getting the money out of politics is never quite on the table. Addressing the budget is never quite on the table. Right. And so that's what we wanted to take a look at, these issues that seem to enjoy duopoly support, so to, so to speak, that all directly affect the function, the healthy function of the Democratic Republic. And so that's where that, that gave us fertile ground, a lot to explore. But it was easy as well to, or it was um, refreshing in a way. I mean, don't get me wrong, it wasn't a refreshing project. There was plenty of bad news involved, but it was refreshing <laughs> to take a look at something that didn't, where we could kind of avoid issues, polarizing issues, and we didn't have to 
point fingers at this party or that party. We could really talk about like, how did we get here? And we're, if we were to change course on some of these things, would outcomes not become necessarily more representative? You know, right, of course, right. it won't be perfect in the near term. It's going to be a long process, 10, 20 years to get thing, a government working how we might like it to work. But you'll definitely get more representative outcomes the more and more of these straight up barriers to representation you can remove. And so that's what we focus on. And a lot of times it's going to have to do with passing laws rather than just electing candidates, which Alaska knows all about. Right. Well, and I think it's interesting because many of us are kind of aware of the corruption and things that go on. But this allows us to peel back some of those layers of the onion to see exactly some of the things that we could point to to say this is what we're talking about. Uh, I know that Justin Amash and, and Thomas Massey, uh, there's a few people that I really follow closely in in the uh, in the uh, U.S. Uh, Congress and Senate that uh, that that have brought these things to light in the past, and it's good to be able to peer down again underneath where the sausage is made and say, "What? Wait a second. What? I mean, how how does this work?" And I know you work closely uh, with some of these congressmen to uh, to tell this story. Uh, Justin Amash, I think, uh, was uh, was predominantly what you're talking about here. Can you give us a, a you know how did how did that how did that come to be? Sure. Well, the interview with former Representative Amash was extremely eye opening. You know, I mean, I anticipated him having a lot of insight. I wasn't prepared fully for the level of candor, and he really didn't put much of an emphasis on pointing fingers either, other than to say at leadership generally. Party leadership, both parties, they really concentrate the power and they run at least the House in in such a way that the deliberative process as prescribed by the Constitution simply cannot happen. Simple as that. You know, like you're not allowed to propose amendments unless you're really good at raising money, that kind of thing. And the way you get he for instance you come in as a freshman member, they give you a playbook, four hours a day of fundraising, maybe an hour and a half of constituent visits, that kind of thing. You know, the priorities right off the bat you learn quickly are skewed. And that's because that's just going to, that's how they're going to stay in power. There are these fundraising deadlines to meet if they want to be able, campaign mode is constant. There's always another election coming up. It's really, really expensive to stay in the game, to run against the attack ads. They're going to be saying you're a bad person. And so there's this a lot of pressure to be raising the money and that immediately becomes the priority. And therefore, that's all that party leadership is concerned with. They're not like, wow, kid, you got fresh ideas and like a, a working plan for how to fix government. Like right. that's not really of use to, <laughs> right. to the brand. What is of use is you can deliver dollars or votes and dollars often help with votes. And so because of that, people who are in a position to help you with campaign funds become the ones who you must surround yourself with. You're simply losing ground if you don't take lunch with that lobbyist or whoever. And, and, and so that's very much the culture there. And Amash could speak to that with a lot of insight as, and, and, and talk about how, how constantly he observed it. And it didn't have to do with ideologically whether he agreed with the person or not. He could just see what the culture was. But he also talked about some things where – we early on in the film, we have one story that he told, which I had no intention of necessarily putting in the thing when we went out and made it. But it was just too it felt like a scandal, like a scoop. So we needed to share it. And he was talking about a, something they call the three day rule in Congress, which just has to do with the voting on bills. Right. To, as we know, they're often a thousand pages or certainly never short when they get passed or infrequently. And um, and so. As a, as a best practices matter, they've got what they call the three day rule that no matter what, rest assured, you know, we might be churning out the legislation quickly here, but you'll have three days to read it. And then he t goes on to discuss how what that means is it's just purely a technicality, purely window dressing. It's based, it can be just before midnight on Tuesday or you know, just before midnight on Wednesday. And then you vote on it just after midnight on Thursday. So it's 24 hours and a little bit, he says, you know, it's not even three days. And then and in addition to that, they it's legal for them, like by, per house rules to just swap out the bill, like the right. substance of the bill. So they introduce a thousand page bill just before it becomes Wednesday, late on Tuesday night. They, then Thursday morning through an amendment, they take out 800 of those pages, put in 800 fresh ones and then call a vote. And they will tell you that you had three days to read it. That's what he said, you know, and like he was just laughing as he was saying it, you know, it's, I couldn't tell it apart from satire. And yet this is how it's working. 
And the reason for that isn't that the people in charge don't have a better idea of how they might do things. It's that the goal is to pass it in the dead of night. And then right, right, right. both parties do that. And the reason is because the incentives are tied to getting allowing specialized interests to have a disproportionate impact. Sure. And because... that's, so, I mean, I, I got right into some of the wonky details just because I want to tell that story. But. That's really what the movie's about. Well, it's just and, about yeah, and, and it's got to be infuriate. I mean, you know, for for somebody like me who's a you know kind of a libertarian, and as you pointed out earlier, you've got this two party dichotomy that uh, you must have. It's a binary choice. You must vote for A or B. There is no C or D or E or F, and right. and you know that there is no other alter. You're you're mocked mercilessly if you decide to vote <laughs> for some kind of third party. Uh, candidate and you're part of the problem and if you didn't vote for my guy then you that's automatically a vote for for the for the other guy even though you may have voted for a third person um, I mean it's just kind of this thing and and they're just it's just continuing I mean this thing is just continuing I mean we're we're you know trillions of dollars in debt they all pay lip service to you know what what the problem is and how they're going to fix it and then when they get in there we see more of the same and it doesn't matter if they have an elephant or a donkey on their lapel it seems like everybody's part of the problem at this point yeah I think that's true and the re what we say is that the system is such that it's really self-reinforcing I mean, you can point to Amash or any number of other individuals who in their hearts may not be part of the problem and may well intend to go there and change things, but they're going to quickly be marginalized and discover that they can't really change things. That it, Even if they want to introduce the let's do business cleanly bill, that won't get a vote on right. the floor. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so well, we've it, seen they, it. They don't control what... Sorry, go ahead. Well, I would say we've seen it, right? I mean, we've got Justin Amash and Thomas Massey and Ron Paul and and uh, and Mike Lee, and there's been a handful in there that went in there that were like, whoa, 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 this is not how we're supposed to do business. And immediately they're the fringe, right? I mean, those they oh, those guys, they're kooky. They're you know, and, and they're immediately uh, ousted by their own party and ostracized by their own party, let alone those on the other side, because they're monkeying with the money machine, right? Daniel Falconer is our guest, filmmaker uh, with uh, We Are Unrepresented, which you can find at weareunrepresented.com. But, I mean, this whole thing, uh, Daniel, is 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 kind of be frustrating. As a, as a filmmaker, it must be, it must feel good to bring it out to the light, but at the same time, God, you got to feel dirty. It's like you need to take a shower every day when it's all over. Well, yeah, certainly it is frustrating, but what I – I want to be sure to highlight is that the movie does then pivot towards solutions and we didn't we were it was really important to us not to just tack on like 10 minutes of we can do it kind of feel good right at the end right but to instead really explore some of the movements uh like the one that brings me to you today you've got fix us alaska is hosting a screening and they're they're involved in trying to change things at the state and local level and hoping that it'll eventually bubble up. And I listen to your program, and that's what you're doing as well. You know, you're covering local, state and local politics like it's cool to talk about. And right. that's what it really is. Because, right. you know, if, if we settle into the fact that it simply will not change in four years, regardless of what candidate A, B, or C says, and it's going to take a while and be incremental, then we'll accept that we'll continue to see things that really upset us from Washington. Hopefully they don't completely derail us in that time. But that meanwhile, we'll be able to do things like Alaska and Maine have done and pass measures that make at least the outcomes in our own states and who we send to Washington to do our business uh, more representative. You know, right. where you've at least you've already gotten rid of that uh, that spoiler kind of like false arguments about how you're throwing your vote away to vote third party when you introduce ranked choice voting and top four primaries. And we've obviously got to wait and see how that goes. But I think generally States that have it are pretty happy with it. Cities that have it are pretty happy with it. Certainly other countries, they don't ever revert to something like our system once they introduce that. And I think we'll see why. But there are other measures, too, to maybe pass an amendment that might overturn Citizens United and related cases that predated Citizens United that have resulted in this flood of money in politics. I think we can all understand the idea that to some degree how you want to spend your money is an expression of free speech. We also see where this completely unlimited injection, constant injection of money is having a corrosive effect on the function of our government. Right. And representation of the unmoneyed constituents is just out the window. Well, we, yeah, so, we know we know special interest is ruling the day. And, and quite honestly, it's one of the reasons why I stopped. I stopped about six or seven years ago covering 
national politics for the most part because it's an exercise in futility. Because, it, right. it, again, you're trying from the top down to try and – and all we do is we all grow very upset and, and agitated and angry, and we just want to shout at our radios. And I, I, just, I thought, how do we fix this? Well, it's got to be from the bottom up. We've got to work on what's in our neighborhoods and in our communities and in our cities and boroughs and states – before we die, try and fix what's going on nationally, because otherwise, I mean, it, we, we can't control that. We can what we can control, what we can change, is what happens next to us, not three thousand miles away. And so that's been my mission here over the last five or six years in trying to do that. But to see this, we've got to understand it. We've got to understand it to be able to change it, and and to ask the questions of the local politicians who then end up going to Washington. We've got to ask these hard questions. That's exactly right. And we've got to advocate at all times, not only for the policies we'd like to see, but for these kinds. Of, we have to remember to talk about the system in these ways and just say that, OK, I'm really happy with the vote you took against the debt or having to do with climate change or what have you. But if you're still going to side with your party when they defend gerrymandering and I've seen how you've drawn up the districts in this state that and don't any, you're effectively excluding voters. What's up with that? Like, why are you trying right. to cement a permanent advantage for your party? That's what about that's democratic? And we've seen both parties get dirty in that from on a state by state kind of basis. And that's something that it's it's not going to get fixed. I mean, they happen to have HR one, SR one that they're talking about now, but that's don't expect that to be fixed at the federal level. But right. meanwhile, Michigan, the state I come from, we took that on with a ballot initiative, and plenty of other states they're doing that. It's tougher if you, the voters, don't have the ability to get amendments on your ballot, but there's still ways where you can, again, focus local and watch it eventually turn the tide nationally. Like as an ex in the film, uh, Josh Silver makes the case, the head of Represent Us, one of the large groups doing this kind of work. Um, he makes the case about how we've seen that there's precedent for this in history. Uh, a lot of movements, like say, whether it's women's suffrage or medical marijuana, you know, regardless of how you feel about those issues. When Marijuana eventually becomes legal at the federal level, however, however long from now, it won't be because people in Congress just woke up one day and said, oh, you know, maybe it's not that harmful. I guess we could. It'll be because more than half the states are currently in violation of federal law. And right. after a while, they realize they have a credibility issue. <laughs> and so we can do that on any other front. You know, we can do it with money in politics. Right. And that's what the film tries to highlight. Uh, so, yeah, it's good and depressing, but hopefully it empowers you that little bit as well. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Daniel Falconer, filmmaker. This film is going to be uh, screened virtually starting uh, May 23rd, which is Sunday at 6 a.m., and it'll run Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or excuse me, uh, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. And then on the 25th at 6 p.m., you guys are having a virtual panel discussion where it's going to be you and uh, David uh, Walker, the former Comptroller General of the U.S., and others who are going to be part of this panel. Um, where do folks go to uh, to find out more about this, da uh, Daniel? Well, yeah, as you've been good enough to mention a couple of times, our website is weareunrepresented.com. But additionally, on the old socials, where people are probably listening to your program, they can just search the word unrepresented, should get you there. Hopefully we've got that kind of swagger at this point. But uh, if not, we are unrepresented. We'll definitely do it. And particularly you Alaskans, uh, get in touch with Fix Us Alaska because they're the ones hosting the screening. And yeah. through their website or through their Facebook page, you can register. It's free. You can, you've got a couple of days to watch it. And then you can tune in for the panel. And uh, it really does help to contextualize all this stuff. You know, we, I mean, again, it'll probably be a sophisticated viewership tuning in if they're listening and decide to watch. But nevertheless, it's nice to have all that stuff that just came at you for an hour kind of contextualized or put in terms of your own state, uh, which is what I expect the panel. To right. Do. Daniel, I just wanted to uh, uh, to say thank you and give you a, a final bite at the apple here uh, with anything that we may have missed or not covered here. But I'll just say that if these issues, if they, if they strike Accord with you if you're interested in them. I do hope you'll check us out. We've gotten a lot of feedback about how nonpartisan our approach is, and the reason is because these systemic issues really are nonpartisan. They're just well, American. Yeah. We want the government to function properly, and then we can debate about policy.
Or you so could you could make sense to you. You check could it out. you could argue that these problems are bipartisan. I mean that they're not nonpartisan. Yeah, I would say that's true as well, yeah, for exactly. sure. Exactly. But wanting to solve them is nonpartisan. I, I, I would agree with that. But I mean, I, I I'm with you, Daniel. I think that this is I mean this is definitely a. a a worthy topic for discussion, and I look forward to it. Is this your first film uh, that is specifically diving into this topic? or It's the first one where we take it on at the national level like this. Our previous documentary, The Force, which was an exploration of the political history of Detroit, where we come from, we, we talked a lot about the impact of policy on the standard of living that you see, but... We didn't really we didn't talk about these kinds of systemically corrupting issues. We just talked about how sometimes a law gets passed by people who don't really have any connection to who's living there, and then it's really really hard to get that law off the books. You right, know, and right. redlining practices or right. something continue decades later. So we're I've I've been focused on the impact of policy and how it affects people's lives in unintended ways for a while. But this is the first one where we've just said like, how come basic things like get the money out of politics or you can't raise money while you're in session. How, how come we can't get a law passed on that tomorrow? Right. What's the reason? Well, you know, and so we, we wanted to get that question answered. Right. Well, it's basically because the lunatics are running the asylum and they don't want to put that straight jacket back on. That's what's going on. So um, there you go. But uh, so you, we got to rather than try to convince them from inside the asylum, work on the outside in your city and state. Exactly. Exactly. Which is what we're trying to do every day here in the state of Alaska. Well, Daniel, it's been a real pleasure. And I'm, I'm looking forward to watching the film and uh, watching the uh, watching the Q&A panel here uh, on Tuesday. So thanks for coming on board. And uh, we, I, we'll, we'll have you back on the program again sometime in the future. OK. That'd be great. Thanks, Michael. Keep it up. Appreciate it, my friend. Thank you for coming on board and joining us today. Uh, Daniel Falconer, uh, again, filmmaker uh, for We Are Unrepresented. You can find that at weareunrepresented.com. Daniel, thank you so much for coming on board.